Liv and I are here to talk about the hidden data behind teacher vacancies. We'll start off with intros. I'm Allie Bogus. I'm a product manager by trade, which means that I've spent the better part of my career building digital tools for teachers and students. And I work at a social impact org called Emerson Collective. In particular, I work on our technology team where we spend our days thinking about how to use technology and data to drive inspiration and innovation across a number of issue areas. Education is a central pillar for us and where we'll be spending uh, our time today. Liv. Um, hi, I'm Liv. Um, I'm a first grade teacher. Um, this is my second year of teaching, so I'm very new at this. And so um, I was a teacher looking for vacancies um, about two years ago, more like a year and a half ago. Um, and so I will be talking a little bit about my experience um, finding a job um, in the DOE. Uh, we'll start off with a bit of a, an orientation into the data landscape behind teacher demand in general and teacher vacancies specifically. We'll spend a little bit of time introducing you all to an early stage product innovation called Work in Ed, which is one of the first tools to develop real time teacher vacancy data across the country. We'll talk about some early insights that our team has surfaced as we have spent some time getting uh, introduced and used to this data. And then last, but very much the least, we will turn the conversation to a New York City lens, this is New York City, Open Data Week after all, and this will be a conversation between Liv and I, where Liv talks about what it's like to be a teacher in an era of teacher shortages and how the data that we'll talk about here might have impacted Liv's job search a few years ago and how it might impact her career going forward. Okay, so it's perhaps to no one's surprise to talk about teacher vacancy data. Talks starts with headlines about teacher vacancies. Uh, the headlines here are a smattering of articles that have come about over the past few years, particularly I would say during the height of the pandemic. We saw a lot of media narratives around teacher shortages. I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, have scanned headlines like these. We've never seen it this bad. America faces a catastrophic teacher shortage. There's a ton of truth to that. And part of the reason why I'm so glad Liv has joined this conversation is because the best sort of folks to bear witness to what it's like to be amidst a teacher shortage is to ask the students and teachers who are living that every day. And so in the back half of this conversation, Liv will talk about what that's like. I also posit that there is an unstated truth behind these headlines, and it comes out in a few ways. The first is that it's a mistake. It's not entirely accurate to talk about the teacher labor market as a single phenomenon. When we talk about teacher shortages, the story is wildly different depending on what type of teaching you're talking about and where you're talking about the need for teachers. So for example, if we talk about the need for special educators, the story is wildly different than if you talk about the need for math teachers or for elementary teachers like Liv. If you talk about the need for teachers in New York City, the story is wildly different than if you talk about it from the perspective of Houston or Alameda, California or Providence, Rhode Island. It's not to say that we don't need teachers everywhere across the country, we absolutely do. But it is to say that we can be more accurate and more effective in how we talk about the need for teachers when we recognize that this is a highly localized issue. Secondarily, these are news headlines, but this is not new news by any means. Our education system has struggled with teacher shortages for decades. And part of the reason why it's so hard to talk about this topic with the accuracy and nuance that it deserves is because of this third point. This is an extremely data poor sector in education. So I'll, I'll, I'll rewind and revise what I just said. Our education system has struggled with teacher shortages for decades. And across that entire time, uh, our education system has struggled with teacher shortages for decades. And across that entire time, we have lacked up-to-date national data that shows where teachers are needed. And so our team got interested in this about a year, year and a half ago, and we were curious about these kinds of headlines. 
In particular, we were curious about the data behind a statement like a catastrophic teacher shortage. And we discovered what I just shared with you, that there's not really any real-time data. The data does exist. Districts report into state departments of ed and states report into the federal DOE and that information is made public. But by the time it is, we're looking at vacancy data that's one, sometimes two academic years old. And so when you're talking about making decisions based on those data, whether you are a policymaker who has resources to wield or you know, attention, finite attention to dedicate, or whether you're a teacher who is looking for a job, if you are basing those decisions on data that's one or two academic years old, it hinders our ability to be effective. Over the past year, the team that I work on has been working on a tool that we call Work in Ed, which we like to frame it as a national heartbeat of teacher vacancies. I'm gonna drop out of the slides now so I can demo this to you. So Work in Ed is a public website, workined.org, if any of you want to visit it. Uh, I'll note that um, the data that you see here is reflective of active teacher job postings across the country. And we collect this on a weekly basis for what you're seeing here is reflective of 45% of public school districts across the country. So it is a work in progress. These districts represent about two thirds of students nationwide. So as needed to prioritize, we focus on some of the larger districts where we want to represent more students. Along the left side of this platform, you can see that we can filter by grade, by subject, or by hiring timeline. So let's say that I wanted to look at special educators across the country, the need for them. I can filter by that uh, and I can zoom in. And what we're seeing here is an interactive map. So the data is going to change and become more granular as I zoom in and let's look at the tri-state area. This is we're in New York City after all. Um, we don't have data for New York City Department of Ed, a point that I'll return to in a moment. But let's look at, for example, Newark, New Jersey. So I see that there are 35 special education jobs open at Newark Public Schools at this time. This data is collected, like I mentioned, on a weekly basis, and we do that collection on the weekends. So Saturday, so it's happening right now. So the data that we're looking at is reflective of last Saturday's collection. Still pretty accurate. If I move over to this list, I'm gonna see what those jobs are. I wanted to load. I can scan the list here of all of the special ed teaching roles that are available at this moment in time at Newark Public Schools. The idea here is to show opportunity, to visualize what those jobs are. And our hope is that this will catch someone's attention and they'll explore more. So let's say I'm interested in this ASL teaching role uh, for the 24, 25 academic years, so the next school year. I noticed that this job was posted three months ago, even though we have collected it six days ago, which means that it's, you know, it's, it's old, take that for what you will. Within this box, we have included some basic top line information that you can expect for a job. And we've designed this with educators. So these are some basic data points that an educator would look at as they're scanning for a job to discover whether this is of interest to them. The hope is that it is. And they'll click something like read more on job board or apply on job board and we'll take them to the original site, the moment to load, where we got this information. And the reason for that is because the goal of this tool isn't to be the place where applications happen. There are plenty of tools that do that already, this one included, but instead to be the place that aggregates this information nationally, which is a utility that we didn't see existed before, and to shine light on areas of need. So let's say that I, uh, Let's say that I live in Newark, I don't, but let's say that I do. And let's say that I'm already familiar with Newark Public Schools. And I wanna widen my aperture. 
so I'll eliminate Newark Public Schools and let's let's just search to see what pops up for Newark. And let's say that I have a car, so I'm willing to commute a bit outside the city and we expand the radius here to what, let's call it 10 miles. And we start to see a whole lot of job opportunities that open up. An user can work through that same workflow, right? 10 special ed roles in Bloomfield Township, for example. The goal really is to visualize opportunity where it hadn't existed before. Let me jump back to the slides. Because what we realized is that when you're able to solve for the data piece, suddenly what was a data gap or a data challenge turns into an opportunity. And it turns into an opportunity across really every stakeholder that exists across what I'll broadly call the teacher pipeline. Let's start with the lives of the world, the teachers. When we're able to solve for the data piece, we're able to influence and empower teachers to find a job in teaching and to stay in the profession. I want to double click on the last part of that phrase for a moment, staying in the profession. Usually when we talk about teacher retention, we're talking about it from the perspective of encouraging a teacher to stay in their school building for many years. And there's a lot of truth to that, right? There's a lot of importance that comes with continuity for a teacher, for students, for a school building. But we also recognize the truth that sometimes that's not sustainable. Sometimes the teacher has to leave a school building and oftentimes they are leaving the profession when that happens. By opening the aperture to other opportunities whether that's a school in the same district, a neighboring district, or a job across the country, we make it possible to stay in the profession, even if not in someone's current situation. I wanna highlight the quote that's in the lower left-hand corner of this slide, and I'll articulate it. So this came from an aspiring teacher who was one of our early testers when we launched Working Ed in January. This is a student who's in college, he's taking uh, credits to become a teacher. And so he has his eyes on the end game, even if he is a few months out from the job market. And he looked at the site and he said, this website is giving me hope. It means that I can be a teacher anywhere across the country and I have a pretty great likelihood of getting the job. And that was really amazing for me to hear because it's very rare that we talk about the teaching profession from the perspective of economic prosperity. And that was really sort of the narrative that I was hurting, and that really turned a light bulb on for me. Let's move to the middle column here. Teacher preparation. Teacher preparation, as many of you probably know, comes in a, a bunch of different stripes, right? There's traditional schools of education. There are alternative pathways to teaching. Liv will tell us about her role, her pathway in a sec. What we've discovered in testing with a whole bunch of these organizations is that there are two big opportunities that open up when teacher prep practitioners have access to this data. The first is perhaps obvious. Teacher prep practitioners who are operating in kind of like a career coach or career services capacity can use this data to support their students in finding student teaching and long-term placements. And that's particularly resonant because we know it's well documented that most teachers will end up teaching within a 20 to 40 mile radius of where they themselves went to school. And so to have this ability on what the jobs are in proximity to a program where their teacher is learning to be a teacher means that you're probably finding jobs that are of greatest appetite to those individuals. A second opportunity uh, we discovered in testing with teacher prep folks, and that was in terms of the partnership that can be built between prep and districts. So when we're talking about teacher shortages, we're talking about an already existing need on a district, right? It's, it's, it's a bit too late, it's after the fact. When a prep program can build a pipeline between the teachers that they are producing, the teachers that they are training, and a district, that flips that calculus. That means that a district can articulate and forecast a need, can articulate that back to the prep program, and that can influence type of teachers that they are producing and essentially meet the need before it becomes a shortage. And so I've borne witness to teacher prep practitioners who are using work in ed 
and they'll essentially zoom in to their program and then zoom out a little bit. And they'll look at the districts around them and they'll scan the jobs that are open there. And they'll use that as sort of intelligence of, oh, here's a need in our community, or here's a district whose door I can knock on and see if there's a partnership to develop there. And that's the sort of behavior that turns shortages into a strategy that we can use to preempt that situation from happening in the future.